Hello and welcome to Themis Podcasts. Themis is an award-winning platform that helps our clients mitigate and manage their financial crime risk exposure. Our podcasts discuss the current and emerging financial crime threat landscape and bring you thought leadership and interviews from leaders in the field. Find out more at crime.financial. I'm really delighted to be here today talking to Rocio Domingo Ramos from Anti-Slavery International, where she's the Business and Human Rights Officer and doing some tremendously important research and policy work on tackling forced labour in supply chains. So, uh, Rocio, welcome. It's lovely to be here with you today talking about such an important topic. I wonder if you could start off by giving us some context on forced labour worldwide, what the issue is and what's the scale of the problem and how forced labour makes its way into global supply chains. Yes, of course. Um, Well, first of all, thank you so much for having us on. And I think to maybe understand what forced labor is, let me start by defining the term modern slavery, because uh, sometimes there's a bit of confusion around when we should be using one term and when we should be using another term. But um, basically modern slavery is an umbrella term. It is an, an overarching term that we use to bring together. Uh, but it's it's also then quite helpful to understand day to day how does modern slavery and forced labor actually look like? Because many of us may associate slavery with um, chains and physical restraints, but actually most cases of modern slavery are due to what we would call invisible chains. And Modern slavery can take many forms. It can be something that we would see in the news, in the newspapers, that could go from trafficking into sexual exploitation, forced labor, bonded labor, can also take the form of forced marriage and exploitation into crime. But it could also be people who are making our clothes, who are serving our food, picking crops, working in factories, or also people working in houses, and that could be cooks, cleaners, nannies, and and so on. Then I just wanted to mention here as well, because in September this year, so just a few months ago, the new global estimates of modern slavery were released by Walk3 Foundation and the International Labor, Labor Organization, and they showed very concerning numbers. Um, their their estimates indicate that nearly 50 million people are nowadays living in in a situation of modern slavery, which shows that this issue is still on the rise. And this increase that we have seen over the past few years could have been partly driven by the large scale crisis that have been unfolding worldwide. And among them, I mean, of course, COVID-19 and the impact that it had on workers. I also mean conflicts such as the war in Ukraine and uh, the climate crisis that is rendering people very vulnerable to be suffering from this exploitation and uh, forced labor. So these are all contextual elements that have intensified the underlying drivers of slavery. And these underlying drivers of slavery or root causes, however you want to call them, would include, for example, poverty, discrimination, and this rising displacement caused by the war in Ukraine, climate change, and so on. Um, Then out of this 50 million people that are currently trapped into a situation of modern slavery, there are over half of them that are specifically being exploited into a situation of forced labor. And out of all of these people, over 70 million of the cases that are taking place are happening within the private sector. So in other words, that means that these 70 million people in modern slavery are being exploited within companies' value chains. And that is a huge number. Um, so why is it that this exploitation takes place and flourishes? It's because people are not fully protected by their laws in their countries, because people may be discriminated against, because they may be 
trying to escape a situation of poverty, seeking a better life. These are all some elements that really make people extremely vulnerable to being trapped into a situation of forced labor. And all of these, or almost all of these forms that I'm talking about are hidden, they are complex, and they are very difficult to spot, which makes it even harder to quantify the real scale of the issue, but also most importantly, make it even harder to ultimately putting an end to this exploitation. That's some fantastic context um, if some truly awful statistics there highlighting the scale of modern slavery, uh, but really stressing, I think, how important efforts against this are and how crucial the work you do anti-slavery international is. So perhaps we could move on to what you think is needed globally to address these issues, especially from a legal or regulatory perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I can, of course, speak on on behalf of the work that we are doing here at Anti-Slavery International, as well as I'm also able to give a bit of a picture in terms of what the context is, what the the developments are in terms of what we are seeing happening around the world. But I think your your question is absolutely key because to end forced labour and global value chains, a priority has to be to ensure that there is strong regulation that protects people and the planet. And we have made this a key priority for our work. We do realize, however, that there are no silver bullets. So there isn't just one instrument that is going to be solving all of the issues that we are seeing. So therefore, when we speak about addressing modern slavery, forced labor and the root causes, what we are calling for is a toolbox of different measures and instruments that need to be put in place by governments and also the the coordination that is needed across countries but also within countries in terms of the different stakeholders that have a role to play here that's absolutely crucial um we have seen several developments taking place worldwide as i was saying and mainly we have been focusing around the implementation and um, different proposals that are currently out there around mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence legislation and also import controls legislation for goods and services made or provided with um, forced labor and then I think here it is important that we speak about what differ, what difference w- would it actually make for companies and for people if governments start adopting some of this legislation. So I'm first going to start to describing like what is mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence, because that is something that for people in the field. There are increasing conversations around these and and companies are becoming increasingly aware that these sort of requirements is something that might be coming uh, quite soon, actually. Um, Because I suppose, particularly for businesses, when they think about what due diligence is, well, due diligence is something that they have to do to prevent risks from affecting the business, right? But this is a... A slightly different approach because when we are talking about monitoring human rights and environmental due diligence we actually have to think about what are the risks that the business operations are putting on people and the planet so it's looking at things from the other side basically and what we would want um, mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence framework to achieve so if, if this framework is effectively designed and implemented, it would require companies to undertake due diligence to identify, assess, prevent, mitigate, and remedy human rights and environmental risks and impacts across the entire value chain. And this is according to the UNGPs, which are the UN guiding principles for um, human rights. 
this framework as well would hold companies accountable when they cause harms and when they breach the due diligence standard of conduct, that that's also something very important for those people that have been affected by the negative impacts of these corporations. And then a third element that is crucial here is that such a framework should require companies to undertake meaningful stakeholder consultation. So they need to really focus their efforts on the prevention of these adverse impacts in the first place. And this would include by examining, for example, the impact of their business models, their strategies, and also the ability of their suppliers and sub-suppliers to meet all of these labor, health, and safety, safety standards that are needed so that forced labor doesn't take place. Um, and then on the other hand, moving on to import controls, import control is also a very powerful policy tool that can really prevent companies from um, not, not really prevent companies, but what import controls can do is they can act as a very strong incentive for companies to ensure that they are putting in place the right mechanisms to undertake effective due diligence. Because if they don't, if they fail to identify, you know, these risks or, or these adverse impacts within their value chains, then they're going to be facing their products being um, withheld at the border and they, they would therefore not be able to, to sell these products in, in the markets that they are intended to be sold um so yeah um again this this import control should be designed in a way where any goods made or transported either in whole or in part with forced labor should be stopped at the at the border um of any countries and then companies would then have to prove that this is not the case that these goods have not been made with forced labor or to take action to remedy the situation on the ground before these products can be imported into the respective country or region. We have seen some of these developments taking place around the world. So within the EU, um, the European Union has published proposals for both of these instruments. There are also developments taking place within the European Union at a member state level. Then we have also seen other developments, for example, in the US with the import controls that they have in place under the Tariff Act. Um, we also have the US, Canada, Mexico trade agreements that pose similar requirements, but also that there are calls for this legislation also taking place elsewhere in the world including countries such as Australia, New Zealand, Japan, etc. So I think I think just to conclude here, I think it's increasingly being agreed that we need to move away from voluntary standards and we need to move towards binding legislation because that's fundamental to drive meaningful action. And and it is actually time that governments around the world make sure that their laws truly protect people and truly protect the planet from the negative activities and impacts of corporations. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very much agree with that. So is there anything um, that the UK is doing particularly on this mm -hmm. further afield? Yeah, um, so the case of the UK is slightly different to what I've been mentioning with regards to the proposals that we're seeing, for example, in the European Union and within member states. Because in the UK, what we have, we have the, the Modern Slavery Act. And within the Modern Slavery Act, we have the Transparency in Supply Chains Clause, which requires businesses to publish an annual report disclosing which are the steps that the company is taking in order to address 
modern slavery within their supply chains. The problem with this is that this is trans a transparency piece of legislation, which is very important as a first step for companies to be able to undertake their due diligence. Um, however, TISC, which is the Transparency into Supply Chain Clause, does not go far enough. And it does not go far enough because at the moment, a company can publish a statement which says, we are not doing anything to address modern slavery in our supply chain, or we have no risk of modern slavery taking place in our supply chain. And as long as that document is signed by the appropriate level of seniority, uploaded to the website and updated every year, then well, that, that company is actually being compliant with the law, right? The issue is that that doesn't drive meaningful action it it does a really good job at putting the issue on people's agendas because it's increasing awareness that modern slavery is an issue among businesses but ultimately does not require any kind of action unless it is something that the business voluntarily wants to do in a way so at the moment, we have no commitment from the UK government in terms of putting forward something which is stronger than this, but we are calling for a comparable due diligence model to be introduced in the UK. So here in, in the UK in particular, what we're calling for is the Business Human Rights and Environment Act, which would require companies to undertake human rights and environmental due diligence uh, within their, their value chains. Um, I think even though th there is still not commitment from the UK government, there is very strong support from different stakeholders that are joining our civil society calls for such legislation. And for example, a YouGov poll from August showed that there's very strong public support for these sort of laws that will require companies to take meaningful steps towards stamping out the exploitation of workers and also avoidable environmental damage in their supply chains. Um, the polling res results that we got show that there's a huge 87% of the respondents that would support new laws requiring companies to take meaningful steps to ensure that their supply chains do not exploit people. This is a very big percentage of the people that got this survey. And then it's not just public support that is out there. There's also business support that are calling on the UK government to pass this sort of legislation. So also this year, there were 36 leading businesses within the UK that have backed laws that would compel all companies to carry out human rights and environmental due diligence in supply chains. And I think here the, the argument for business is that first, it levels the playing field. It means that companies can no longer benefit from the exploitation of people. And those companies that are doing the right thing then uh, cannot be undercut by those benefiting from this exploitation, right? So this is a, a very key argument. Then there's also the, the argument of a, a piece of legislation such as the one that I'm talking about would provide legal certainty to companies, right? Because at the moment, there are different bits of legislation out there. There's um, that would cover different types of human rights abuses and exploitation, but what a Business Human Rights and Environment Act would do is bring all of these elements within the same legislation. And also, if this is aligned with the developments that we're seeing elsewhere in the world, then that means that a company that is operating in the UK, but is also operating within the European Union, right, doesn't have to significantly address the way that it behaves for them to be able to continue operating in those markets, right? So it's about making sure that there's coordination 
across the world because it's undeniable that the how interconnected supply chains are and how global this issue is that really shows the need for this global coordination when it comes to to legal requirements for companies um and then i think also beyond all of this arguments it's just we need to bear in mind that this is just the right thing to do uh and and businesses need to really respond to these and really need to make sure that the workers are at the core of their business and 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 make sure that businesses put people before profits in everything that they do and i think just to end here because this is also very relevant to the UK case, there is very um, big investor support for <coughs> this legislation. So same thing this year, 39 investors that represent 4.5 trillion pounds in assets under management have written a letter showing the support for a new UK supply chain law. So what we need right now is we need everyone to join these schools for stronger laws and, and we need to show the UK government how urgent this issue is and how urgent it is that they start taking action and implementing this legislation at a national level. Those figures of support are so encouraging. That's a, that's a really kind of good news story to end mm. on, isn't it? I'm just going to pause the podcast here to tell you about a newly launched Themis product. The Themis Risk Assessment is an easy to use online tool that you can send to all your suppliers and third parties in order for you to gain a holistic view of all your third party risk in one heat map. It helps you meet your legal and regulatory requirements for outsourcing arrangements. Find out more at crime.financial. Now let's get on with the podcast. So are there any other bits of supporting regulation or controls that are needed to complement these laws, do you think, as well? Mm -hmm. So I think, um, as I mentioned before as well, due diligence legislation and import control are not a silver bullet. We need to be working on other instruments as well that would complement these pieces of legislation and that they truly address the root causes of modern slavery, forced labor and exploitation. So for example, that can include human rights clauses within trade agreements, um, development policies, uh, basically anything that governments can do to put pressure on companies to do the right thing and that there's this level of accountability for those businesses that are not doing the right thing. And also, as showed in my previous answer, this this has to be a joint effort, right? So there needs to be meaningful action by businesses. There needs to be meaningful action by investors because they have a huge leverage over what businesses do and what they don't do. And also, of course, the, the government, because they are um, the ones in, in charge of introducing and implementing this legislation. And also the, the public has a very important role to play here. Oh, that's really interesting. I'm sure, I'm sure our listeners would love to know what they can do to support some of this work, if you could give them some ideas. The public has a key, a key role in putting pressure on companies and on putting pressure on businesses. And there are many, many ways in which people can do that. So, for example, we need to be calling on the government to bring forward these laws. And you can, for example, sign petitions and uh, you could find a link to a petition for our Business Human Rights and Environment Act within our website. Um, you can write to your MP as well and uh, bring this issue to their agenda and start generating debate. Um, also, I think as, as individuals, we can put pressure on our employers to join these calls for stronger legislation. And I think 
ultimately as, as well it is about raising awareness of the issue it's it's about making sure that each department within each company is doing everything they can to tackle the issue that's fantastic thank you it's really great to get some very concrete examples of how the public can help to move forward these really important causes um, from an expert like you uh, so before we come to the end of this podcast, is there anything else that you'd like to leave listeners with that you feel that we haven't covered? So, yeah, I just I just wanted to say that it, it is also important to to bear in mind that slavery is not something just happening in developing countries far away from us, because, yes, we can be talking about modern slavery happening in certain countries and certain industries, such as, for example, a very timely example, actually, migrant workers building grant projects in Qatar, such as stadiums for the World Cup, hotels, or, for example, something that we might see quite often in the news about garment workers in factories in countries such as Bangladesh and India. Well, it, it is actually any country, including the UK, where there are also very high risk sectors. So in these cases, it might be people we don't realize that are trapped in such a situation. It might be someone working in a private home on our streets. It can be someone working in the local car wash, nail bars around the corner, or the cleaner who empties our office bins every night. And then in, in terms of numbers, the amount of people identified as victims of modern slavery has also been rising year on year within the UK. And there are 12, uh, over 12,000 people that have been referred to the authorities in 2021. And due to the hidden nature of the abuses that I've been mentioning, the, the real number of people trapped in slavery is actually estimated to be much higher. And we may have heard about some of these cases, for example, if we look at the garment industry, some of the people listening may have been following in the news reports and investigations that have found systemic abuse in Leicester garment industry with workers being paid just £3.5 the hour, way below the national minimum wage and having to work in horrendous conditions in uh, factories that are pretty much crumbling. Um, then some other some other cases that have been in the news quite recently has to do with migrant workers in Malaysia being trapped in situations of forced labor, producing PPE that was then being sourced by the NHS. Um, but also there, there are other products that we buy that are tainted with forced labor that we don't always hear about or, or that they don't always make it to the headlines. So for example, we work with partners in Kenya that are fighting the exploitation of women who are picking the flowers that we are buying here in the UK and gifting to our loved ones. Then similarly, coffee or cocoa from Brazil are products that we may be consuming on a daily basis, but also products that we may not even realize where they are coming from. So for example, Turkmenistan is a country with state imposed forced labor, where every year there are thousands of people that are forcibly sent to the cotton fields in Turkmenistan to pick cotton for the government. And this takes place in um like workers have really have to work under horrendous conditions. Sometimes they're being sent to the fields for two, three, four weeks four weeks during the cotton harvest and are having to abandon their jobs as teachers, doctors, nurses, and so on. And this cotton then ends up in the clothes that we buy and the clothes that we use without us even realizing. So these are just some of the examples as to where we find forced labor closer to us than than we think those are some pretty horrible uh very important yes. case studies 
uh, thank you. Yes, I just wanted to make sure that I, I raised those because I yeah. think, yeah, those are pretty tangible things that people can think about and yeah, yeah. And it's very, it's very, very important that people realize as you say that it is it's we're all touched by it aren't we in our daily lives it's not just happening on the other side of the world with products that we're not having access to so thank you so much for your time and insight today here Rocio it's been a real pleasure talking to you about some really hard-hitting but very important issues I'm sure it's given our listeners a lot to think about so good luck in your continued advocacy work and I hope to be able to talk to you again once there's been some national progress in this area Thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Themis Podcasts. Find out more about Themis at crime.financial.com.